Want me to clean up those disgusting scars? Uh, no way. No, these are my trophies. Congratulations, you look like a f***ing scratching post. Before we start recording, Dan, I'm glad you talked me into putting my shirt back on because it probably isn't appropriate that I take my shirt off for recordings. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, it's a little bit of an odd uh, characteristic. You know, I've been meaning to talk to you about it the last few years that we've been podcasting. I'm glad you've finally taken my advice. Well, you, and you've given that advice before and I just ignored it. But then when I watched this latest episode of Lower Decks and I saw Ransom take his shirt off, I thought, that's a little odd. And then I realized, oh, wait, that's what I do. And then seeing in that way, I was like, OK, now I know what Dan's been getting at. So I put the shirt back on. Well, you know, we thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, welcome everyone to another episode of Positively Track, where we're discussing a Lower Decks episode, and this is episode number three. I'm with Dan Gunther. I'm Bruce Gibson. Dan, I see you have your shirt on. That's a good sign. Yeah, I, I tend to keep uh, my shirt on for podcasting purposes. It's always a little cooler in Alberta than it is in Atlanta as well. So, you know, there's that. It is a little stuffy in here right now. I really need to turn the air down, but I don't have time to do that because we're doing a podcast. So again, we're going to talk about episode three of Lower Decks, Temporal Edict. And so tell me, Dan, what'd you think of this title? I thought it would be a time travel show along with, I'm sure, every other Star Trek fan out there. I kind of felt like Pike in season two of Discovery, you, you know, you get to this episode and you're like, where's my time travel show? I was expecting a damn time travel show. <laughs> I know. So why is it called that? Well, I mean, they're playing on the word time temporal, right? Because the edict handed down by the captain for the, the rule to using your time well. So, you know, it, it still has to do with time, just not time travel. Although we do see the distant future in this episode at one point. Exactly. It made me wonder about that, too. When I saw that, I was like, maybe that's the whole temporal thing right there. But we'll get all into that. So, yes, yeah, spoilers ahead. Spoilers ahead. If you haven't watched it, then you may not want to listen to this episode. And again, apologies to those internationally outside of the U.S. and Canada who can't see this it's sad, but I don't know what's going on with that. I just think that there was some business decisions made. You know, I think there's a distributor out there. They're just not distributing yet because this series was supposed to be coming out later anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I saw some speculation. I think I saw you post somewhere too that, you know, they probably had a deal in place for it to start going out, you know, probably October, I think is kind of the month we had heard before and it may be that the international distributor just doesn't want to change that schedule now. And, you know, they're probably trying to convince them to do so. But these things, sometimes they don't budge on them. So it would have been funny if everyone else got Discovery and we had to wait for it. Like we got Lower Decks, they got Discovery, and then we flip flop later. But that's not even the case. But anyway, let's get into this episode. So first impressions, Dan, because you were telling me before the show about this and... I'd like to hear you tell everyone else what you were thinking. Yeah. So if you've watched my review on YouTube, you know that when I first saw this episode, it kind of wasn't working for me. I wasn't really on board. And, you know, in retrospect, uh, I've, I've watched it a few more times. And each time I watch it, I see something new that I really like about the episode. And it keeps kind of moving up in how I feel about it. That said, of the three episodes we've gotten so far, I, I think this is the weakest for me. But again, that's only three episodes. It's still really good. I'm still really enjoying the series. I have to say, I like how much we've learned about some of the other characters we haven't seen focused on. Ransom, in particular, in this episode, I think shines. Jerry O'Connell in that role is just hilarious. I think you couldn't have cast this better at this point. But uh, yeah, I think some of the humor maybe didn't work as well for me as in the previous episodes, but watching it each time, I keep finding something else that makes me appreciate it more and more. And, you know, after three viewings now, the humor is actually working better for me. So not, it's my least favorite of the three so far, but it's still definitely on the uh, high side of good. Well, that's good. That being said, I will say that 
and I predicted this long ago, that Star Trek Lower Decks is my least favorite Star Trek series. It's not because I don't like it. It's just because it's not your typical Star Trek. I like the live action Star Trek and stuff. This is, you know, a humorous cartoon take on Star Trek, which I kind of put in a separate category from really all the others, even a somewhat separate category from the animated series even, Mm -hmm. but I still enjoy it. And I will say this episode I did enjoy. I would say I would rank this probably as my second favorite episode. The first episode being my favorite, this being my second and the last one being my least favorite. And I think it's because of several reasons. One, I did find myself laughing more in this episode than I did the second episode but not as much as the first. So really I'm rating my enjoyment of the episodes based on my laugh track, how many times I've laughed. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really laugh all that much in the second episode. I did quite a bit in the first one. And this was somewhere in between those two. These were more little giggles or little, uh, (laughs) ah, like that stuff. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. But I really loved Mariner and Ransom. Like I'm going to tell you right now, This episode got me to the point where I really love Mariner. She's now my favorite character on the series. I didn't come into this after the first episode having a favorite character. I was liking them all and just starting to get to know. But it's something about Mariner that is just like, I feel like she's smarter than everybody else on the ship. Yet she's also very undisciplined. But I think that's in a good way because, because she's so much smarter and more intelligent than I think most people are on there, that's why she acts the way she does. It's almost like she doesn't take them seriously. And here's her first officer, and she's a low ensign in the lower decks telling him, hey, you can't do that, and that's not right. And, and I'm like, I like this girl, man. It's like, I want to be Mariner. I really like Ransom in this episode. I really like him and Mariner together. Mariner, I also like that she kind of gets taken down a peg in this episode too. Her assumptions about Ransom aren't correct. You know, that said, she does push him to do what he does, but he as the first officer really does step up and defend his crew and, and do a really good fight with the interlocked Kirk hands. You know, attacking this Vidnor, Vindor, big, huge brute. You know, there's there's a lot to like in this episode. And, you know, Mariner's character growth, I think, is definitely one of them. And And she feels more like a real grounded person in this episode more than in the previous episodes, I think. I, I just like how she even does her little shout out things, you know, as uh, Ransom is fighting Vindor. And she's just like, ooh, so ethical. You know, like she's turned on <laughs> by that. At first she's like turned off by him. Now she's turned on. And, and earlier when they were getting the fight scene with the spears and he's going to help do this, she's like, all right, that was awesome when he fails. You know, it's just like, just stuff like that. And Ransom is a character that in the first episode and kind of the second episode too, like was probably my least favorite of the main characters because I just thought, oh yeah, he's just whatever, first officer. Like, to me, there wasn't really anything interesting to him. Seeing him portrayed more in this episode with Mariner. Like, I don't think I would like him as much if we didn't have that exchange with Mariner. Mm -hmm. Because I like how he's like, hey, look at me, and I'm so great, and I'm so wonderful. And she's like, yeah, you're not, and you're really kind of dumb. Okay, so (laughs) I love that exchange. And the little hints of there's interest between the two, you know, like... You know, not that I necessarily want to see them get together, but I just think it's kind of funny, too, that they seem to not really care for each other that much. More so her not caring for him, but there's also kind of this little spark of romantic interest or Mm -hmm. just a little turned on and, wow, she's hot. She That's kind of hot, you know, or whatever he said, you know. Yeah, that little bit of, of sexual tension was definitely unexpected. And I'm, you know, interested to see if maybe that goes somewhere, resulting, I'm sure, in some hilarious situations down the road. But, you know, it just occurred to me while we were talking, it feels like Ransom is kind of the end result of a Boimler type character who gets more self-confidence 
because oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah. There's that one moment where you know Mariner says something like rank doesn't matter here, and he's like, "What rank always matters everywhere." <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, that sounded a little Boimlerish." Like it's interesting that he's kind of the straight laced Starfleet officer that kind of goes on to be the heroic first officer. If Boimler gets a little bit more self confidence and that sort of thing, I see him kind of on that path. No, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about it that way, but yeah, I think you're right on it. And I also like how she's accusing him and says, your crew, you know, you didn't, you need to save your crew. And she's like, he, and he has to point out to her, it's our crew. I mean, there's a thing where she looks at herself as being apart from everybody, you know, that she's not really part of this crew. She's her own person. So she's looking at everybody outside of herself as you guys are all doing this. I know what I'm doing. I'll do my thing. And I think maybe as we see the series go, we'll see her wanting and starting to learn that she needs to be more part of the crew. This is a family. This is us. And we should respect one another. I'm not saying she doesn't. She kind of respects people, but then she doesn't because she seems to start to respect Boimler where originally she didn't as much. Yeah. It feels like, you know, she feels like people around her kind of have something to prove, but she doesn't like, she knows she's awesome, but the people around her kind of need to make her aware that they're, they have value as well. And she doesn't really see that at first until they kind of do something that makes her notice them, if that makes sense. And yeah, I think that stems from her feeling very much apart from them and, and a little bit, you know, maybe better than the average person kind of thing. So I, I think that's an interesting character piece for her. And she keeps talking about her past years and her past missions. And that kind of gave me the indication this time around, not the previous episodes, but this time around, I kept thinking, is it possible that she's on some kind of secret mission that she's actually maybe even a rank higher than Ensign, but she's on the ship to observe something and she's knocked down a level to be Ensign so she can blend in to figure or find something out hmm. because she has, she seems to have a lot of knowledge and experience and it just, and the fact that her mother's the captain and, wants Boimler to kind of keep an eye on her. There's some history or something in her past that we don't know. And I'm just really curious to know if it's just that she got in trouble or maybe she's on some kind of spy assignment. It's possible. If she's trying to blend in, she's not doing a great job. But yeah, it's it's definitely possible. I I want to know what happened in Scottsdale. (laughs) It sounded like a rough place. (laughs) Right. Yeah, I'm really enjoying her. And even like in the battle with the spears and everything, she's the one who just like comes in and starts knocking everybody. That's why I'm like, she's a little overboard, like in experience and abilities than a lot of these other people. And and to feel comfortable enough to just, you know, tell off the first officer and eh, I don't know. It's just like she's a little bit of a rebel and too much confidence mm-hmm. uh, in her abilities, which she does have. That makes me wonder. Yeah, there's more to her story obviously, than what we know. So since we're talking about being on the planet, what about the Galrakians? What do we think about those? I mean, they we, we've never seen them before. They're Federation members. Sometimes, you know, they can be very uncrystal like sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I like the uh, the fixation on crystals, you know, that kind of Star Trek trope of monolithic species having one focus. And their reaction when they see that the uh, the Starfleet away team has got wood. <laughs> right. That was that was pretty amusing. Uh, yeah, I, I I like these guys. They invade the the ship basically to like paint graffiti on it because, yes. you know, and you know they're crystal spears and stuff. But you know, kind of interesting high tech looking spears too. I don't know. When I first watched this the first time, I was you know just not really into them kind of thing. But like I said, on subsequent watchings, I, I appreciate the humor that they're going for with these guys and the wood loving star fleeters that they're trying to force off their planet. I think. Uh, there's some funny stuff in this for sure. Yeah, there were some funny stuff in there with them, but they didn't, they just weren't that standout to me. You know, it wasn't like, oh, I want to see them again. They were okay. Yeah, the crystal stuff was pretty funny. And, you know, their honor crystal and how they're going to kill the rest of the crew with their little crystal ball or whatever hanging down. <laughs> oh, the something. adjudication geode. I really love that name. That's 
you know, so those little things and the little leader he had, you know, they all had the piercings of crystals in their ears, but he also had one on his navel, you know. Oh, I missed that. Piercing. Yeah, he's got one on his little navel, you know. So it was like little things in there are cute. And, and then they had Vindor, who Ransom was fighting, which, you know, the whole trope of Ransom, like Kirk, you know, I will fight without weapons and take my shirt off, you know. That was a lot of fun, too. And just to see that uh, Ransom beats Vindor and Vindor's basically like, he tells him he likes to read. And then later <laughs> Vindor tells the leader, like, you know, can't we just like have a court of law instead of a court of battle <laughs> yeah i love this guy he he wants to read all he wants to do is read and he tries to like reform their justice system but the leader's like oh we need a death race of some kind and he's like oh <laughs> I, I, yeah i really enjoyed that instead of the trial by combat which is funny too because when they threw the blade into the cell and mariner and ransom are fighting who's gonna fight and then he stabs her in the foot mm-hmm Ransom stabs Mariner in the foot. What is all these injuries? In the first episode, she got Boimler, you know? It's like now she gets stabbed. I mean, what the heck? There's blood in these episodes. It's funny. I was kind of speculating like years ago about Star Trek and like how easily they fix injuries and that sort of thing. And I've always wondered, would that lead to people being more cavalier about really serious (laughs) injuries? And this show really seems to have taken that and run with it. It's like, yeah, just stab my ensign in the foot. You know, just slice into Boimler's leg with a bat lift. No big deal. Just go to sickbay and Doc will wave a light over it. It'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> you stabbed me in the foot. <laughs> it's just like, oh my gosh, yeah. The and hell's the matter that... with you, man? <laughs> <laughs> right. And then later when she is in sickbay where they can fix her foot, you know, she doesn't want the scar to be removed. She loves her scars, which that worried me in that cell scene because... She starts showing Ransom her scars and she's opening her shirt. Then she pulls her shirt this way. I'm like, oh my gosh, they're not going to have her like take off all her clothes because she started pulling that shirt every which way. I was like, oh no, keep the shirt on. She seems to take her clothes off a lot in these episodes. She does like in the first episode, right? Her and Boimler were in their underwear. So, but yeah, she, I I think it's kind of cool that she likes to keep her scars. But again, there's that history. She's got many scars, Mm -hmm. you know? And she and those scars are important to her. Yeah, definitely. So. One thing that I liked, and I just kind of made this weird connection while I was watching it. So Ransom puts her in the brig because she disobeyed his order to unroll her sleeves. She keeps her sleeves rolled up all the time and he figures that's unprofessional. You know, what are you? Uh, work, we're not working on a, on a farm or whatever he says. <laughs> Um, puts her in the brig for that. The end of the episode, we learn that the most important person in the history of Starfleet is Chief Miles Edward O'Brien. And if you watch Deep Space Nine, he's the only Star Trek character who ever rolls up his sleeves. So (gasps) coincidence? I think not. (laughs) Oh, gosh. I'm so glad you said that. (laughs) I hadn't thought about that because I kept thinking, okay, yeah, let's talk about that ending scene. So, yeah, we go far future and they're saying, you know, this big statue of Boimler because he's the laziest, most corner cutter officer in Starfleet history. And and, And he's got the great bird on his arm (laughs) lovely lovely tribute to gene roddenberry by the way i was like that's great i watched this the first time with my wife and when they said the great bird of the galaxy did they say the galaxy or just the great bird they said one of one of the great birds of the galaxy is the line my wife just turned and looked at me i was like she knows she picked up on that nice so i thought that was kind of cute and funny and because, you know, of course, Boimler wants to be known as being, you know, following the rules. And now he's known as the, you know, cutting corners hero of the universe. <laughs> and then there's said, and also another important member in history. The most important. The most important is Chief Miles O'Brien. And first of all, I didn't think that looked like Miles that much. Like, I don't know. He looked more like Tarkin to me from Star Wars. <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. But I was like, why Miles? I was just like, that's just like a random choice, I guess. But it's funny to me. But now that you say the rolling up sleeves, that's it. (laughs) I think he's actually the most important person in all of Starfleet history. 
do you really? Because you always say Star Trek is based on Worf. <laughs> That's true. That's true. No, I just, it's just a joke, but I, I liked it. I thought it was good. Uh, I think, and, and I may be crazy, but I feel like it's kind of a roundabout reference to those web comics, Chief O'Brien at work. Have you seen those? Oh yeah. I forgot about those. I feel like oddly enough, it's a reference to those because the O'Brien that we see in that scene is him at the transporter console of the Enterprise D just standing there looking bored. You know, it's not him from Deep Space Nine when he was, you know, involved in the Dominion War and all this stuff. It's just him at his transporter console. And I, I just feel like it's a reference to that. And if you read those, you know that all of Deep Space Nine is just a daydream of O'Brien's anyway, imagining himself as a more important person and having a better job. So, you know, <laughs> I'm kidding. Of course, I love Deep Space Nine. I don't believe that. Deep Space Nine is amazing. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's, yeah. I, I like the rolling up the sleeves, but now that I'm thinking about it, it probably isn't that, but it may be. I don't know. I just, I'm curious to know why they did pick O'Brien. And maybe it's for the reasons you, you just said that, that little web comic or something. I don't know. But, or again, just, they just thought it would be funny if it was O'Brien for whatever reason. But I'm on board. I love O'Brien. <laughs> <laughs> I love O'Brien too. Let's talk about the other storyline in this, which I would consider the B storyline. And, you know, this kind of plays off something that I sometimes tell people at work. And I'm looking over your shoulder right now, Dan, and you have a picture of Scotty behind you. Mm -hmm. And I remember in the TNG episode Relics, he's telling Jordy, well, how long is it really going to take you? And Jordy's like, whatever it was. What, an, three hour. hours? <laughs> an hour. An hour. He's like, yeah. you don't tell him it's an hour. You know, you tell him it's longer and then you get done sooner and you look like a miracle worker. Yeah, you and know? that that goes right back to Star Trek Three, where Kirk says, "Scotty, do you always multiply your repair estimates by a factor of four or whatever?" Scotty says, "Of course, sir. How else can I maintain my reputation as a miracle worker?" <laughs> <laughs> you got that just perfect there, <laughs> just how he says it. <laughs> so this episode reminded me of those because you know that's what they're doing. They're doing buffer time you always got to buffer your time you know you don't ever say how long it's really going to take you and i like it when tendy is then called by the doctor and the doctor's like how long is it going to take you to fix this bio bed or whatever it was and she's like oh it's going to take me five hours oh that's great <laughs> you can tell she's going to say like five minutes or something you know mm -hmm. that was my first laugh of huh. the episode okay yeah i like that no, I, I like this idea of buffer time. I like that, you know, it's just kind of worked into this. And, you know, it's funny that Boimler, you know, he's not really on board with it. He's like, oh, it's just tradition, but, you know, I, I think we should do away with it. And like in the course of this episode, he gets his wish. He gets taken away. I may be reading too much into this. And I brought this up last night as well. Is this a little bit of like a class system riff? like the upper class versus the working class. Is is there a little bit of that? Maybe it's just like the revolutionary in me coming out, but like, I feel like there's a little bit of that in this story. Maybe I'm reading too much into what's supposed to be a joke, but I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure where you're getting at. Are you talking about because Boimler's surprised that the bridge crew was doing this also? Well, or? that's kind of the twist at the end, but if you think of the ensigns on this ship as the working class, right? right. They're trying to eke out a little bit of time for themselves to make like life work living. But then the directive comes from on high. No, you have to be productive at all hours. You have to work and then immediately start working on something else and immediately start working on something else. And it felt like a little bit of a indictment of, of the working class system, capitalism, that kind of thing a little bit. And then the twist comes at the end when we find out the bridge crew has been <laughs> made to do this as well. And the captain is just completely losing it. Which Boimler is surprised about. Yeah, they're all completely, which is good because you know, if you're going to ask your lower deck crew, all you know, those who report to you that are under you to do this, you should be doing it too, you know, set by example. So that's good. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, I hadn't thought about that way, but you're probably right. 
you know. I also saw, I think it was Ket Walski on his YouTube channel was talking about how he wondered if there's a little bit of a deeper meaning to this as well, knowing that like the animation industry is very much like you have to turn out so much work in so little time kind of thing. <laughs> like the animators were maybe getting something a little bit out of this, like, oh yeah, this is what it's like. <laughs> could be, yeah. Or it's just could have been what we talked about earlier, the you know, Scotty saying buffering time in a sense, and they were just like, Oh, wouldn't it be funny if everybody was doing buffer time and they were like, No, you gotta keep going and which is funny too because I like how they all had their pads that have countdown clocks giving them time actually you know that's what i need because you know sometimes you get to a situation at least for me when i'm at work and i'm working on something and it goes past it goes a little longer than i expected or i'm spending too much time on email answering email where i really should probably be focusing on something a little more important and for a while i started doing this i mean and i'm getting a little off topic but it's related to buffer time but when I had a job previously to what I'm doing now, I was like really busy. It was like the busiest job I ever had. I had so much on my plate and I, I just think, you know, I was not giving some things as much attention as others. And, and, and those needed as much attention, if not more sometimes. And I noticed that my daughters, when they came home from school, they would talk about how, oh yeah, I only have like five minutes to get from one class to another. And I realized how their schedule is laid out. They have math for an hour, then they have literature for an hour, science for an hour, on and on and on. And so I scheduled as much as I could my day where I gave hours, like this is the hour that I do email. This mm -hmm. is the hour I do this and stuff. These are the hours I'll make open for meetings. And it worked. I was getting more done because not that I was using buffer time, but I, it was just, you know, scheduling things and giving myself a certain. So there was times I had to rush through things because, oh, I only gave myself a half hour and I got to get done in a half hour. That episode reminded me of that. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I listened to another podcast called Cortex and they talk about like, you know, how to do certain things for building a business and all that kind of stuff. And one of the things they really advocate is time tracking. And they say, like, before you even work out your schedule, you know, take a while and just keep absolutely meticulous track of what you're doing and how long it's taking and that kind of stuff. And I thought that was really interesting. And I was thinking about that while watching this episode as well, that, you know, uh, some eggheads at Starfleet Command have decided this is how long this thing should take. So that's how they're allocating it. But, you know, the ensigns know how long something actually takes. You know, this should be, if you really want to institute some system like this on a starship, start with them and talk to them and be open about it and say, like, how long does it actually take to do this thing and, and you know, work with them on it. But anyway, that's yeah. that's not the purposes for a 24-minute funny cartoon though <laughs> no no but it was interesting how it was actually destroying productivity in a sense because mm -hmm. people were getting tired and and they weren't getting the things done because they had to move to the next thing and then when the invaders come onto the ship now they're supposed to keep doing their work while fighting the invaders which isn't very productive getting rid of these guys coming onto the ship because they're still trying to do their work and the captain's yelling, come on people multitasking, you can do this. And it's like, no, they can't. Not until Boimler who, you know, loves the rules and loves getting rid of buffer time and loves having this time limits on things and who sits there and works on certain projects and he's purge, 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 purging, purge, 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 and doing all that. He comes up with the idea that it's too much for everyone. And then it's like, yeah, everyone slack off, do buffer time. We're calling it the Boimler effect. <laughs> and he just hates that a rule about breaking rules is named after him. Yeah. And this is kind of where the little bit of like class system uh, commentary comes in, I think just a little bit. So, you know, people aren't cogs in a machine 
and the captain was treating them as such. If you have buffer time, if you have a little bit of downtime, that's when people get creative and they're able to think of new ways to do things. And, you know, that's where society, if you read this ship as a society, that's where it flourishes. And that's when it can respond to outside threats and things like that. But if you're treating everybody as just a cog in a machine and you have this amount of time to get this much work done, then you have to move on to the next thing. They're no better than a cog in a machine, just a little part of this big machine rather than a thinking, feeling human being that can respond to different stimuli and different effects and that sort of thing and, and be creative. So, you know, that's where I thought that came into it a little bit. Um, Boimler, I, I love that this episode is a bit of an inversion of the first two episodes. So if you think episode one and two, Boimler kind of has a rough time of it through the whole episode and at the end kind of gets a little bit of a like, oh, actually, you know, everything's good. So in the first episode, it's the pink goo that he brings on board ends up being what saves the ship. And he gets that scene with the captain where he makes her remember his name. And then in the second episode, you know, he wants to quit Starfleet. He feels he's not good enough. And Mariner gives him that little boost at the end. And then he's riding high at the end. This episode, he's riding high through the whole episode. Like this is Boimler's time to shine. And then at the end of the episode, he gets knocked down a peg when the Boimler effect gets named after him. And we find out that it will endure for millennia as, you know, this legacy of his. <laughs> And what I like prior to this, earlier in there, before they start coming up with these rules uh, to get the work done, before it becomes the one week later and we see everybody freaking out, I love how the captain starts realizing that something needs to be done. And as she's just going down a corridor, she just you know, sees people walking and she's like, oh, just scrolling through the ship as slow as possible. And that was funny to me because, yeah, when you're watching like TNG or Voyager or what Deep Space, whatever series, and people are just casually walking down. Nobody seems to be really in a hurry or really that busy. They're just casually walking through. I thought that was funny. I always wanted to see that in like the next generation or something, you know, the captain's walking down the corridor and you see a couple ensigns. And I, wa I just always wanted them to kind of notice the captain was there and like, oh, look busy, look busy. <laughs> Start <laughs> working on their pad or like tapping a computer console or something and just kind of glancing over like, I'm working. <laughs> <laughs> And did you like uh, Boimler in the turbo lift? Yes. His little <laughs> humming the TNG Star song? Trek The Next Generation theme, which yeah. is right out of Stargate. There's a Stargate episode where uh, Samantha Carter is in the elevator at SGC and she starts humming the Stargate SG-1 theme, <laughs> which is oh, okay. hilarious. Well, I think we pretty much covered it all. One thing we didn't cover, I'm just curious about what you thought the very opening, the cold opening, where uh, Boimler's playing the fiddle and then Mariner gets up and starts rocking and the ship is shaking. I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, I, I like that I, apparently there's a Klingon engineer dead because of that <laughs> incident, if you really pay attention to what the Klingon captain's saying. Yes. Uh, the the base is, uh, you know, annoying him. So he said, oh, the captain says, oh, it's not on our end. Must be your end. Engineer, you will die for this or whatever. Oh, man, that's that's not good. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was cute. It was kind of fun scene. But I, I guess final thoughts at this point, I, I would just say, like you, I mean, the first time I watched it, I laughed a little. I kind of enjoyed it. And then I watched it a second time. And I liked it even more the second time. Again, I mean, this isn't like the Star Trek I get excited about. It's not like, you know, Thursday's coming up and I'm like, oh, I'm really excited Lower Decks. It's just more like, oh, cool. Yeah, Lower Decks comes out tomorrow. Oh, yeah, I can't wait to watch it. I mean, it's fun. It's cute. I enjoy it. I don't think it's all that funny. I like other stuff like Family Guy and whatever, all those other shows that I find even funnier a lot of times. And I mean, this is okay, but as a Star Trek fan, it's just a nice little cute thing for me to watch and enjoy for about 25 minutes. Hmm. I, my, my opinion is vastly different from yours. I'm totally every week really looking forward to Thursdays and, uh, I'm really enjoying this. I, I like the humor. I really like that it's actual Star Trek. Like it's not just some show that's pretending to be, 
Star Trek like and making us laugh at that, like the actual graphics in the background, the actual sound effects, the actual characters and costumes, they're Star Trek. And to see this comedy in that universe, I'm really looking forward to it every week and loving it. Did you have any thoughts on what kind of the major message from this episode was? I'm not really sure. I hadn't thought about it much, I guess. And I'm just, this is just going off the top of my head because I'm thinking about the rules and, and the buffer time. And I'm also thinking of Mariner and Ransom on the planet. I guess it's just that you don't follow things to a T. I don't know. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, th- I think this one's kind of the most on the nose, straightforward message of all of them. Basically, Yeah, people aren't just pieces of a machine. They need that buffer time. They need that downtime to be creative and to to do things well. And I feel like that extends to the Mariner Ransom stuff on the planet too, that like, you know, people don't just slot into these roles and fulfill these roles because that's, you know, what they're supposed to be. There's room for creativity and doing things a little differently. And I feel like Ransom learned that from Mariner a little bit, but Mariner also learned that from Ransom that, you know, he's not just the first officer because, you know, Oh, I'm just the first officer and I just blindly follow the rules. No, Ransom steps outside that role as well and does things that are contrary to how he usually just does things by the book. So I I think that's kind of where I'm at with the, with this is, yeah, not just blindly following the rules like you said, uh, but allowing for some variation and human creativity. Yeah, if you need to write a speech on the wall to let the aliens let you go, then that's your creativity right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what Starfleet expects of him. That's the rules, but that didn't work. He had to just club an alien. <laughs> that that's that had right. that had to be how to how to get out of the situation. Yeah, and I don't want it to come as if I don't like the show. I just want to make it clear. I really do enjoy the show. I'm just saying I don't get as excited about it as I do when we get the typical live action Star Trek stuff. I mean, I do enjoy it. And if if anything I'm enjoying it more. It's growing on me even more. So I am looking forward to the next episode. So we'll we'll see how that goes. So Dan, where can people find you online if they want to talk about Lower Decks or anything Star Trek with you? Well, mostly these days you can find me in the Positively Trek Facebook group discussion group. And uh, we'll be talking about these episodes of Lower Decks and anything else Star Trek. You can also find me on Twitter at Kurtrat. K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S It's just Star Trek backwards <gasps> There's a lot of people that didn't know that <laughs> <laughs> And you can find me on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex And of course you can follow Positively Trek On Twitter and on Facebook and Instagram It's easy to find And we also have an email address Which is, let me see if I get this right Is it Positively Trek at gmail.com That is right? correct There you go. So uh, we'll see you next time and uh, stay positive.